This title is taken, you probably all know it, but the Prince de Ligne, who is the greatest gossip and um, most worldly man of his day, um, wrote to a friend from Vienna, Le Congrès ne marche pas, il danse. The Congress isn't working, it's dancing. A play on words. Actually, it, well, it did dance a lot. Um, and it didn't ever work in the convention sense. In fact, one could argue that there never was such a thing as the Congress of Vienna. It never convened. There was no opening session. There was never one session when they all sat down around a table. There's a painting of them all standing around a table, but they never did. There was no protocols taken. And the only time when all the delegates found themselves in the same room was that when they came to sign the final treaty nine days before Waterloo. And even then, the four main delegates weren't there, and the treaty was not complete, because various things were left for later. And yet, it lasted for months and months and months and months. This extraordinary inability to sit down and concentrate is the more surprising in that this wasn't just a normal Congress convened to sort out what happened at the end of the war. Like 1945, 1814 saw the defeat not just of a country, not just of one man, but of a whole system and an ideology. The Allies, as they saw it, all the good people in Europe, the righteous Allies, Sweden, Russia, Prussia, Austria, Britain, Spain, Portugal, Sardinia, um, and then gradually all the states of Germany, except for Saxony, had all come together to defeat Napoleon and stamp out the evil of the French Revolution. And they didn't just mean what had happened since the fall of the Bastille in 1789. They saw that something, a terrible doctrine, which had been, some people thought it started with the Knights Templar, others they thought it started with Jan Hus, others saw it in, um, was originating with Luther, uh, others um, simply saw it as the product of the 18th century Enlightenment. Or indeed, some even thought it was a conspiracy by the Freemasons and the Illuminati. Whatever it was, they all called it Jacobinism, and <coughs> all conservative and ruling circles of Europe felt that this evil force, which had caused the French Revolution, which had then given rise to this terrible man, Napoleon, had finally been defeated and crushed. So what were they to do? Go back to 1789? Clearly, just redrawing frontiers wasn't going to work. They couldn't go back to 1789 because too much had happened. The wars that had started in 1792 against the French Revolution had lasted the best part of a quarter of a century. That was six times longer than the First World War had last, and four times as long as the Second. These wars, the fighting embraced the whole of Europe, from Lisbon to Moscow, from Ireland to Alexandria and Cairo and, and Syria. They took in the colonies, from the Caribbean in the west to Java in the east. They involved people from everywhere. And because the alliances were so complicated, young men were snatched from the plough in Portugal and found themselves fighting at the gates of Moscow, while Polish men were fighting in Portugal and Spain. 
people were moved around the whole of Europe. The wars also had an obvious ideological angle. They started with the French, the challenge of the French Revolution. And everywhere they went, everywhere the French armies appeared, institutions were overthrown. The church, the established church, was very often overthrown as well. Where they weren't overthrown, they were deeply shaken and altered. All sorts of laws were changed. Disabilities were lifted. People who had been bound in most of Central Europe, either for religious reasons or for racial reasons or for occupational reasons, were suddenly freed. Jews were allowed out of the ghetto. Young craftsmen no longer had to belong to a guild. The guilds were abolished. They could move anywhere. Suddenly everything had been blown apart. And this ideological angle added a huge element of intensity to the wars, one that hadn't been, hadn't been witnessed since the religious wars of the 17th century, the Thirty Years' War and so on. So all those people who'd been in some ways liberated and brutalised by the wars were not going to be happily put back in the box. Also, the French Revolution was all about a new concept of the nation. Now, at the second half of the 18th century, people began to think in terms of the nation, the community, um, as being a spiritual being, and gradually the nation began to replace not only the sovereignty, but even the deity. La patrie became a kind of goddess. And the French Revolution openly replaced the sovereignty of the monarch with the sovereignty of the nation. The people became sovereign. And this fell on very rich ground as the French armies penetrated into Belgium, which then belonged to the Habsburgs in Vienna. When they penetrated into the Rhineland, which was ruled by all sorts of little princes, and where already the first germs of German Romanticism had also begun to sing uh, the, about the concept of the nation. They fell on fertile ground in Italy, in Poland, everywhere. The, the nation had been awoken as well. So, Nothing was quite going to be the same. So many people thought, well, since we can't go back to the status quo ante of 1789, perhaps this is a wonderful opportunity for a wonderful new start, as many people thought after 1945. Lots of people have been writing about an ideal settlement for Europe. I don't need to remind you that the Holy Roman Emperor Otto III wrote about a system for permanent peace in Europe. So did Dante Alighieri. So did George of Potibrad. So did Henri IV of France. So did dozens of other people. In the hundred years before the Congress of Vienna, Thomas Hobbes, William Penn, who um, invented the concept of a European Parliament, um, Leibniz, the Abbé de Saint-Pierre, who wanted a united Europe of 19 states. Um, and even less than 20 years before the Congress of Vienna, Immanuel Kant on perpetual peace. There are a lot of people dreaming about perpetual peace. There are also a lot of people who had been thinking throughout the 18th century about a more rational way of reorganizing the world. After all, the Enlightenment produced dozens of utopian texts on how to organize society better. And then, of course, there were the beginnings of the Romantic movement, and also a religious awakening in places like here in Germany, with the German pietists, in Russia with Nikolai Ivanovich Novikov, um, in America, even in England, 
there was an awakening. People began to think about maybe a return to a better spiritual kind of European order. So all these ideas were washing around, and people had great hopes. At the end of a war, when people suffer, People always think that peace is going to bring something really wonderful, a completely new order. And the longer a war goes on, and the greater the suffering, the more they think, you know, something must come of this, something good must come of this. They thought it after the First World War, they thought it after the Second, and nothing has come of these things. The problem was, so, Lots of people converged on Vienna in 1840, hoping for something, a just and great settlement. And their hopes were um, hugely stoked by the fact that the rulers, the, the people who were going to be reorganizing Europe, were such heroic figures. Tsar Alexander of Russia, who was seen as the Agamemnon of the Alliance, was known to be chivalrous and liberal, uh, fervent, Christian. Everybody thought, well, this man is going to regenerate Europe. There was Francis of Austria, who was the epitome of legitimacy and of good, respectable, but really the ideal good monarch, you know. You know there was a Frederick William of Prussia, dull, but a good, honest man, and so on. So everybody thought, well, surely something was coming. So people came with their hopes, and very quickly they began to realize that something wasn't right. Um, because these people were, in fact, all tainted by what had happened over the last 25 years, because they had all been involved. Leaving out Britain, which conveniently just played the whole game, hoovering up everybody's colonies and getting other people to fight its battles on the mainland for the most part. Every other single one of the Allies had fought with Napoleon against the others at some stage. The, the Prussians had happily joined forces with Napoleon and as a, well, several times, and as a result, got the prize, were given the British King's Fief of Hanover. Russia had joined Napoleon, and as a result, it got a piece of Prussia as one prize in 1807. In 1809, it got a prize of a piece of Austria. Austria had made war on Russia, so had Prussia with Napoleon. Spain had happily invaded Portugal with Napoleon and taken, helped itself to a bit of Napoleon, uh, Portugal. Um, it had also been given a, a kingdom in Italy, the Spanish royal family. Everybody had put their finger in the pies. Russia had also been allowed to invade Sweden and take away Finland for, as a prize for being, um, supporting Napoleon. So, all of these people had also compromised their principles. And they certainly weren't going to give any of the territory they had acquired back. Nor, in Germany, was anybody going to give back, re renounce their royal titles. The kings of Bavaria um, were not going to suddenly become electors again. They were joined pleased to be kings, and they had all profited hugely. All the German states had cannibalized other German states. So suddenly, people like the poor old Prince of Piombino, who had been deprived of his island of Elba by Napoleon, who thought, ah, Napoleon's been defeated, I'm going to get my island back. Not a bit of it. Alexander gives it to who? To Napoleon. And the Prince of Piombino is told to go, you know, go figure. Um, 
Fifi, the representatives of the Republic of Lucca in Italy, which had been abolished by the French, came along and begged the support of the Emperor Francis to get it restored. And the Emperor Francis said to them, as you know, he'd been born in Tuscany, so he spoke fluent Italian. <coughs> he said to them, eh, Tutti hanno fame, anch'io voglio mangiare. È meglio che io vi mangi che se fosse un altro. Saying, basically, look, everybody's hungry. I need to eat too. And I would rather prefer it for me to, to eat you myself than to have somebody else eat you. Um, get real was the message. Um, and indeed, you know, one of the allies, the Crown Prince of Sweden, Bernadotte, had been a Napoleonic marshal, had himself been a, he actually used to call himself, je suis républicain dans les entrailles, I am a republican to my guts, un déterminé jacobin à la vie et à la mort, a, ja a jacobin in life and in death. And yet he, um, there he was amongst the allies. Um, the Prussian minister, Harnberg, referred to him as a bastard whom circumstances have obliged us to legitimize. Um, and that was the problem. Circumstances had, legit had obliged all of these allies who were going to sit in judgment and create the wonderful new world to behave as badly as Napoleon himself had done, as the French minister, Talleyrand a past master in these things, um, noted. In fact, it was even those who tried to turn the clock back <coughs> found that it didn't work. For instance, Victor Emmanuel I of Sardinia, who had had to take refuge in his island kingdom of Sardinia and give up Turin um, to the French. He returned and he removed everybody who had worked on the French. He threw out, expelled all Frenchmen. He got rid of everything that, that was, he even uprooted the entire botanical gardens that the French had established, uprooting plant by plant and burning them as though they were seeds of contagion. But he kept on the efficient tax collecting system put in by the French. He kept the gendarmerie, he renamed it the Carabinieri. Um, and he made no bones of <coughs> taking over the Republic of Genoa, which the French had liquidated as well. Even the Pope, who came back and sacked anybody who worked under the French, and reintroduced the Inquisition and the Jesuits and sent all the Jews back to the ghetto. Um, and he even banned street lighting and vaccination because they'd been brought in by the French. And so obviously dangerous, ideologically. But even he kept the French tax collecting systems. So they all somewhere were tainted by the new order. And they found it very difficult to go back. In fact, nobody in power intended to bring in a wonderful new system. The only people who counted were the big four. Britain, Russia, Austria, Prussia. And they had decided a long time before what they wanted to see. They had already signed a treaty at Chaumont in March 1814, setting up a quadruple alliance a kind of league against France, they believed they had stamped out Jacobinism, this plague, by military might, and they saw the only way of keeping Europe safe by having a real blanket military system that was going to stop France from ever um, disturbing the peace of Europe again. And so they had decided, and they meant to meet, in fact they met, a month before everybody arrived in um, Vienna, 
and they meant to finally sort out all the details so that in Metternich's words there would be um, less to negotiate than to ratify. Unfortunately, it didn't work out quite like that. The problem was that there was, when you think about it, there was Russia in the East, there was Prussia to the north and Austria to the south. And in the middle was this great mass of the German and Polish lands. A great big power vacuum at the heart of Europe. And the problem was who was going to actually dominate this? Because whoever came to dominate this would dominate Europe. And so before that, there had been the Holy Roman Empire. They couldn't bring that back. Nobody wanted to bring them out. Because then they would have had to give back all the poor old Freiherrs who would have got their little places back. And the kings of Bavaria and Baden and, and the Grand Dukes of Bargain, and all that, they would have had to have given back all those territories and given up their royal titles. So the idea was that somehow a system of control must be made to control this area. But how? And the big problem was insecurity. Everybody was worried about who was going to dominate. And the new truth had appeared that the larger the power became, the more insecure it became. Britain, which had grown unbelievably powerful during the Napoleonic Wars, and had acquired a system of colonies all over the world, which was going to guarantee it world domination. And yet, it was obsessed throughout the Congress of Vienna by one thing, the estuary of the River Scheldt and Antwerp. So, Belgium, the Netherlands, must not belong to France. They must belong to a Protestant power allied to England. And there must also be a Prussian presence on the Rhine to stop France from coming in and taking over Antwerp again. Because a hundred years before, a Dutch fleet had sailed out of Antwerp and sailed up the Thames. And this was no longer feasible. The Royal Navy was by now so much advanced that no such invasion could ever take place. But never mind, the Edifix was there. Britain was obsessed. They, they didn't really care about very much too much of what else happened as long as that. Russia, which had managed to repel the most powerful army Europe had ever seen, was so insecure that it wanted to move its frontier another 500 kilometers westward and have its frontier in Poland. Austria didn't want Russia to have and was also so obsessed that it might be attacked by France through Italy that it wanted to dominate the whole of it. Russia was the most insecure of all because Russia had been really very nothing, very little at the beginning of the 18th century. It then became huge with the partitions of Poland. And then it was cut down in 1806, 7, at to nothing. And it wanted to become something. It was one of the big four, but it was, it was nowhere. So it wanted big territory in Germany. So the idea was that Prussia must be given Saxony, because the King of Saxony had remained loyal to, to Napoleon. Um, but Austria didn't want Saxony in the hands of Prussia on its doorstep. Um, Britain didn't like the idea either. Um, and it came to deadlock over this. The four the four principal powers very, very nearly came to blows. Um, they actually nearly came to, to war over this, this deadlock. And they didn't because the, the issue was resolved through hard bargaining. And what it came down to was, in the end, Prussia, which wanted to have 13 million population to make it into a powerful country said ultimately okay i don't care where those 13 million people came from 
where they are, as long as we've got them. <clears throat> so it was prepared to give up half of Saxony, not to take more than a bit of Saxony, if it could make up the missing 3,411,715 souls. So commissions were set up, geographical commissions, which went around every um, circle in, in Germany, counting up the population, and then saying, right, ah, we can give this little bit of <coughs> along the bank of the Rhine to, Russia, to Prussia, and we can give this bit, um, and so the surplus was made up. But while this was all going on, there was endless friction because in their insecurity, nobody could, nobody was prepared to make concessions. And, but everything was intertwined. So, Austria, after it had been beaten by France in 1809, was forced to, because in 1809, when Napoleon was busy in Spain, Austria decided to invade France's ally in Germany, first, which was Bavaria. So the Austrians invaded Bavaria. They were then beaten back by Napoleon and defeated at Wagram, and had to make peace. And they had to give, Bavaria was given as a prize, the Tyrol, the Vorhandberg, Salzburg, Innsbruck, and so on. Now, in 1813, Bavaria said, OK, we'll give you back all of that, because these are Austrian hearthlands. But in exchange, we want the Palatinate, Aschaffenburg, um, Würzburg, Mainz, and so on. Which is all very well, but who is sitting in Mainz but Prussian troops? So it was very difficult for Austria to stand up against Prussia over Saxony, because it couldn't get its Tyrol back, because the Bavarians wouldn't give it back until they got mines, and you couldn't get the Prussians out of mines unless you gave them something in Saxony or somewhere else. And the matter was further complicated because everybody was related to each other. They were not only related to each other, but they were all related to some of the big. They were either related to the Hohenzollerns, or to the Habsburgs, or to one of the other uh, dynasties. I mean, the Grand Duke of Baden, who had made war, he'd sent troops to Russia under Napoleon quite happily, and was married to Stéphanie de Beauharnais, the niece of Napoleon's first consort. But he was also the brother-in-law of the Tsar of Russia. So he had tremendous influence, and so whenever somebody wanted something, a whole chain of connections was brought into play. And because all sorts of other interests were also being negotiated on the sidelines, not in the Congress, because as I said, it never met. But people were going around at parties and going up to somebody saying, look, I want my estate back. I'm Freiherr von something. You know. And you know, I had a very nice estate in the castle. And I've got nothing. Um, I want a bit back, something. And so, you know, they'd go to their best connection. And that connection would go to their best connection. And somewhere along the line, it would <coughs> connect with either the Emperor or the King of Prussia or Tsar Alexander or somebody. And so they found themselves negotiating between dancers at balls, saying, look, okay, I've got this boring cousin who wants this. Can you please go lean on your friend or your relative, um, you know, the Grand Duke or something like that, to let him have something? Or if not, just give him a decoration, make him a, you know, a knight of the order or something, anything. And, but it also spilled out of Germany into places like Switzerland, because you know, the Austrians wanted to dominate Switzerland and, and back all the Conservatives. Um, the, um, uh, 
that the French wanted to keep influence in Switzerland because it was on their borders. And so it, you know, they, they, they encouraged the Liberals. Um, the British were in there because they felt they should have an influence there. And again, you know, somebody's interest here was weighed against somebody else's interest somewhere else. Um, so the matter was incredibly complicated, and in the end, it was quite simply done on an ad hoc business. Okay, you take this number of souls, you take that there, you do this, you do that. Um, and this solution, which was dressed up in a, in a um, great um, document drawn up by Alexander of Russia um, about brotherly love and, you know, the, the common good of Europe and so on, which famously Talavon said sounded like something that would have been written by a free, a, by a, um, by a Quaker sitting in a lodge of Freemasons, uh, but was, was actually regarded as appalling, even by some of the the people on the inside. The, the, con the secretary of the Congress, Friedrich von Gens, was utterly disgusted by this. He wrote, and I quote, the great phrases about reconstructing the social order, about lasting, a lasting peace founded on a just distribution of force, and so on and so on, were meant to calm people and to give this solemn gathering an air of dignity and grandeur. But the real aim of the Congress was the dividing up between the victors of the spoils taken from the vanquished. And his sentiments were widely shared even amongst the, the establishment. Um, the Austrian Emperor's brother, Archduke Johann, commented, It is a miserable Congress, this trading in lands and people. We curse Napoleon and his system, and justly so, for he degraded mankind. But now the very princes who fought against it are all walking in his footsteps. Well, the system was set up. And the received wisdom, at least in Anglo-Saxon historiography, is that it provided a century of peace and stability. Well, it's not surprising that um, Anglo-Saxon historians should think this way because, of course, there were, in fact, a great many wars between 1815 and 1914. There were wars in the 1820s, there were wars in the 1830s, there were wars in the 1840s, there were wars in the 1850s and 60s, there were wars in Italy, in Greece, in Hungary, there were wars between Austria and Prussia, between Prussia and Denmark, between France and Prussia, between France, Sardinia, and Austria. Some of them were slight, but some of them were so bloody that they provoked the foundation of the Red Cross. But you notice none of them involved Britain or any of her vital interests. And as a result, they passed largely unnoticed in the British consciousness. Stability, well yes, there was a kind of stability, but it was a stability built on repression, on the fact that Russia practiced a form of autocracy on the Mongolian model, based until 1861 on slavery, uh, that Prussia was ruled around very much like a military state, that Austria was so repressed in various ways that it was known popularly as the China of Europe, And Henry Kissinger was referred to earlier, one of the great apologists of the Congress of Vienna, the Vienna Settlement. He claimed that Metternich and Castle Ray had created a new legitimacy, a system of balance based on a new legitimacy. It wasn't because you couldn't go back to the legitimacy of the old monarchs based on 
divine right. They rejected the concept of the sovereignty of the people, so they needed a new legitimacy. And according to Kissinger, they created a new legitimacy based on a sensible appraisal of balance of power and what we have learnt to call paramilitic. Um, it's a difficult it's difficult to accept that because from the very beginning from, from the moment the it became apparent what was happening at Vienna. People all over Europe, of every class, began to reject it. Obviously, the left-wing revolutionaries were appalled that none of the, or very little of the acquis of the French Revolution, which Napoleon had been so successful in turning into at least sensible um, legislation and, and state framework, so much of that was thrown out. Liberals who had thought that maybe constitutional models, slightly on the English model, could be introduced, they were disappointed because although all the German states were supposed to bring in constitutions, very few did, and those that did almost all revoked them um, quite soon afterwards. Even Aristocrats were not pleased by what had done, been done. As far as they were concerned, illegitimacy had triumphed. They were not given back their lands, they were not given back their prejudices, their, their prerogatives. Because you see, what had happened was that in a kingdom invaded by the French revolutionaries, any state in Germany or anywhere, there had been usually a monarch, a ruler, and there had been the landed estates. There was always some form of representation. Even if the setup was very feudal, there was always a representation of the people, in this case, the nobility. Now that was all swept away by French nobles. But when the legitimate monarchs came back, they reintroduced, they hung on to the absolutist rule that the French had introduced, but they didn't give back any of the prerogatives or the rights of the local nobility. So even the nobility in most of Europe were not content. More to the point, the intelligentsia throughout particularly central Europe was utterly alienated by the system which, which re reaffirmed the state and remember this was the birth of the Romantic movement. This was the moment in which the individual began to count. And yet what happened was that after 1815 the state became more and more important, and the individual <coughs> was actually um, belittled. And this led in France to the Man du Siècle, famously in Russia to the Lichny Chilovyek, this idea of the young educated man who has no place in the world. He can only either be a blind servant of the state or join the army. There's nothing else he can do because the state ruled everything. Um, and, of course, the settlement alienated, most importantly, the budding nationalism of people like the Italians, Belgians, the Poles, and most of all, the Germans. So many people in 1813 in this country had been longing for, at last, proper German unified state, a, a proper agora, which would be a German agora, not just many kingdoms, um, and they were disappointed. 
Um, interestingly enough, on this point of legitimacy, is that the celebrated Karl von Clausewitz, the writer, and military matters, who began his great treatise on war in 1816, a year after the Congress closed. He pointed out one thing, which was that whereas before 1789, most people in Europe, most of them were peasants or they did not know who their ruler was. They very rarely saw a coin, and when they did see a coin, they didn't really know or care whose head was on it. But by 1815, they did. And they had all grown to care, in quite primitive ways sometimes, about their own locality and about their own <coughs> identity. And Clausewitz pointed out, and the rulers should have known this because they had all mobilised against Napoleon at some stage. Uh, the Habsburgs had mobilised the Tyrannese, remember Hoffa and all that, in 1813. Um, Schill and all those people have been, um, and, and, and Lutzo and all those people have been mobilized to fight a national war. The Russians and the Tsars have mobilized the national feeling, so had the Spanish monarchy. And yet, somehow this was rubbed out. And what Auschwitz pointed out was that the verdict of the battlefield was no longer decisive. Because if, you, if a monarch or a country conquered the territory, the province, if it could not find a political solution that was acceptable to the people in that province, they would have to subdue it by force and subjugate it. And that inevitably led to insurgency and terrorism. And the Austrians were to discover that throughout the Italy, which they were so keen to grab at the Congress of Vienna. The Prussians were to find that in Poland, so were the Russians in Poland, which they were so keen to grab. Um, so this question of legitimacy um, was a fundamental one that they, to my mind, did not and um, this was important because uh, public opinion had really begun to matter. And repressed, it became angrier, bitter, and more radical. Liberals became radicals, then revolutionaries, and terrorists. Nationalists who began by just loving their own country, began hating other countries. <coughs> and no one was more affected by this question on both accounts than Germany. Throughout the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, hundreds of young, educated Germans who felt alienated from the state immigrated to France, Britain, and the United States. And German nationalism, which had begun as a generous and poetic movement by being endlessly repressed, became much more bitter and aggressive. And this pattern was replicated to some extent in many, many nations in Europe. And that, ladies and gentlemen, I think had great all these factors played a great role, not only in launching the war of 1914, but shaping the aggression of it, and also in what happened in 1917 and 1918, which, as you know, then led to the disasters of the 1930s and 40s and 50s. Thank you very much.